Good evening. I will call to order this January 8, 2013 Hudson School District Board of Education meeting. Please stand as you are able and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, the first order of business on our agenda this evening is recognition. I'll turn the floor over to Sandy Kovac. Thank you so much. Last month we had our outstanding athletes with us, and this evening we have some of our most talented secondary musicians with us this evening. So I know Carol Dolly, director at the middle school, is here, so if you'll come up with some of the high school and middle school students. I don't know if they're high school students. All right. Well, might, just be these might just be these wonderful middle school students tonight. Last month, you might recall that uh, Monday night was supposed to be a concert so that Tuesday they could have been at the board meeting. And then, of course, we had snow days. So we, we kind of had a little bit of confusion going on with all the dates. So here comes a few more. Yay! So already last February, so almost a year and last April, students across the state auditioned for these groups. The 2012 Wisconsin Middle Level Band Choir Orchestra and the Wisconsin High School Honors Band Choir Orchestras. Over 3,500 students statewide auditioned for spots in 100 member ensembles. And so the students um, listed on above and present in front of us, there were eight middle school students selected and 13 high school students selected. And then they performed at the Mu Wisconsin Music Educators Conference the, the end of October, October 24th through 27th, down in Madison, Wisconsin. So, Carol, is there more you'd like to share about the process yeah, a little the bit? Process is probably the, mic on. the process is probably the most difficult audition that the state offers for any of their music things because it's a blind audition. The students go into the audition. They have to schedule it months in advance. In fact, by January 18th of this month, kids who are auditioning in April have to turn in their registration. So it's really, it's organized. It's, it's everything is right down the row and, and uh, but they get there and they have to have learned a class B piece of music. The music on the state list is categorized A, B, and C, A being the most difficult, but even like some of these young children who were sixth graders last year and auditioned, they had to do class B music, yet they're not even eligible to perform in the solo ensemble festival because it's just, it's just that's the way it is. So uh, they have the, the bar set high and then for the audition, it's a blind audition where the judge does not know their name, the judge does not know where they're from, they perform, their accompanist leaves, and then they do sight reading and they do some vocalizing so the judge can hear what their range is and so on. Mm -hmm. So after that then it, it just processes down and down and down and it's the same way for high school and for middle school. So it really is quite an accomplishment that these young people have, have earned this, this position and they performed at the middle level honors and high school honors yeah right and so we have two from high school down there but there's more you can see the names up there but that's Katie and Christine Carol and why don't we even have them each come up and say that. their name whether it's high school middle school and whether you were in the choir band or orchestra and if there's anything you want to say about the experience yeah uh, I'm Katie Hackworthy and I was in the mixed choir and uh, I don't know it's just a really good experience to be with uh, just like a higher functioning and a higher level group I guess Um, I'm Christina Minky. I was um, in the band this year, and yeah, I just thought it was a really great experience to be able to work with a group of high-level musicians and learn from them and take in a bunch of their knowledge and be able to bring that knowledge back to my school. So, yeah. Oh, I played the French horn. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Noel Bennett. I was in the middle-level choir, um, and the thing that I liked the most about it was being with um, other musicians that really wanted to, like they had the same passion that we did, like having to audition and stuff to be in it. And um, our director, he was really good too. Like he taught us a lot of technique and like how to really sing out our vowels and stuff, so yeah. I'm Alex Hadlick. I was in the middle level honors choir and I made a lot of friends and I think everyone did because there was just, everyone had so much in common there, like our love for music and, you know, like Noah said, the auditions and stuff and we could all just relate to each other really well. And I'll never forget it, so. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm Joey Schmidt. I just, I was in the honor. I'm Joey Schmidt. I was in the honors choir, and I just thought it was a great experience to be with people who wanted to be there. I'm Trevor Olson. I was in the middle level honors choir, and uh, I thought it was great that there were so many other people that had um, that had put so much work into what they wanted to do, and that they really, really wanted to do this music. Uh, I'm Victoria Leone, and I was in middle level state honor squire. Um, I just think it was a really great experience. I've never experienced anything like that before. We worked so hard to get where we wanted to be, and all the tension that's built up, and then you get there, and once it's finally over, you just really miss it. <laughs> I'm Tori Pitzer. I was in the Middle Levels Honors Choir, and um, I thought it was a really great experience um, just to meet as so many people as there was and to see how much um, talent Wisconsin actually has in the, um, in the choir. And you meet so many people that have the same talent and passion as you, and you never forget um, Dr. Redding. He was our uh, choir er, um, conductor. And uh, he taught us the choir salute, which was this, to keep your vowels straight. So we were there. <laughs> we were using our hands about nine and a half hours of the 10 we practiced. So it's an experience you'll never forget. Hello, my name is Zane Saifula. I played the trombone in the, in the high school honors band this year. And I just thought it was a really terrific experience that uh, Wisconsin youth can go out and participate in this statewide organization, play some really great music. I personally learned and benefited a lot from this experience, and I really hope a lot of other people participate uh, from Hudson next year. It, it takes a lot of parental support to do these kinds of things, and it, it's not a free thing for the kids. The parents have to, they know they have to get them there. They have to support all the rehearsing time and so on. And I would like to say that I am so passionate about it. They have asked me to be the state choir coordinator for the next three years, and I've said yes, so I'm still, <laughs> still going to be involved. All right. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> Board members, any questions or comments for them? Congratulations, thank you for representing not just your school, but your community. You know it takes a lot of time, talent, and dedication, so thanks again. Okay, moving on, we're on to the superintendent's report. I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, we'll talk about the upcoming school board election. We have uh, two seats up for election. And we certainly want to thank the two board members who are presently in those seats, Pat German and Mike Car Mark Kaiserschott, for their service to our community. They have decided at this point not to run for re-election. So we have five individuals who have announced their candidacy, and certainly we thank them for their interest in the Hudson School District and in our schools. Um, by random selection, uh, the uh, following names were drawn in this order for the ballot. There will be a primary because there are five, in, uh, um, five individuals who are running for the two seats, and that primary will be on February 19th. So certainly we hope our community will um, pay attention to that date and come out and express their preferences. So the order on that ballot will be Bruce Hansen, Jamie Johnson, Jim Schrock, Jeanette Coons, and Matthew G. Carey. We just also received word that the parent groups will be supporting or sponsoring a candidate forum, and that date has been set for Thursday, January 31st, um, from 7 in the evening to 8.30, and the location will be announced um, at a later date, so we've sent out information to the candidates uh, about that. Uh, the regular election will then occur in April, on April 2nd, and uh, two, four of those candidates will move forward from the February primary. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those or move on. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. As we look to next year, 
um, we are asking ourselves at the district office, how can we best be organized to support the teaching and learning and the work in our schools? And so as a result of that, we've been working on a new structure and thinking about how can we take our services to the next level of support for every student learning at a higher level. And we have um, presently two departments, uh, the Learning Services Department and the um, Student Services Department that work, have been working together. But yet we believe that um, that organization can be strengthened and we could uh, reorganize um, those two departments into one department. And so um, Director Sandy Kovach and Director Corey McIntyre and Associate Director Dave Grambo are working together and we'll be um, coming forward with a proposal to reorganize those two departments so that we can maximize the learning of our students in our schools and help support our teachers and our administrators um, to achieve at even higher levels. So we'll look forward to that next month. Questions? Any questions, board members? We'll move on. So we have um, a vacancy, as we all uh, know, sadly, that, um, and, and with congratulations as well, uh, with Nancy Sweet's retirement, district direct, director and uh, HR director. And so we're looking forward to um, a selection process to find the next person to um, fulfill that role. And that is laid out before you. Uh, I brought it forward and uh, shared it with the um, personnel department, or, or personnel committee, sorry. And um, this is the process that we have used in the past for administrative positions. And it starts with um, the posting certainly that started December 18th. We weren't sure if we were filling that position internally or, or externally, and we've made a decision that it will be an external um, uh, appointment. And so it was posted on December 18th, and uh, that will conclude on January 25th. We'll do a credential review and move on to telephone screening. And then we will interview up to six candidates. This is quite an extensive interview because those, each candidate who comes in goes through three different interviews. And um, we have um, probably between 18 to 21 people who will be involved in the interview teams since there will be three teams. So you can see uh, those individuals who are listed here and represent um, the employees in the school district. And then we will move on to reference checks depending upon the results of those interviews. And then a second interview will be scheduled for probably one or two candidates to bring back to the district. And the second interview has a smaller group, but it's quite an extensive interview as well. There'll be a writing sample. There's probably a um, HR exercise that the individual will go through as well. So um, again, um, we will be very extensive in how we uh, look at these each of these candidates. And then we anticipate coming to the board with a recommendation for um, hiring on March 12th. Board member comments or questions for superintendent? Go ahead. Tom? Yeah. Madam President, um, yeah, excuse me. just a question, Mary. Um, can you just give us a general sense of the candidates that have you been getting a lot of applications or? I'm going to defer to Nancy. Have you recently looked at the candidates? I don't know if we've looked this oh, week. Okay. So I. I mm -hmm. Well, we are getting applications. We are. For, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually they often come in at the end and the number um, escalates at that time. So you may have in the beginning a few candidates and then it starts as that time period ends. Um, there are more generally. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next item, Mary. I'm very pleased to announce that the district received the 2012 Spectrum Award of Excellence from the Wisconsin School Public Relations Association. This is an association of public relations and community, um, uh, community communications people in the industry. They're experts in the field and they have recognized the district for the secondary space for learning referendum campaign, informational campaign materials. So that was the referendum for St. Croix Meadows, the dog track, 
and um, that is a certainly an honor for us. Um, the entries are scored on how well the project fulfilled its purpose, matched high quality communication tools to targeted audience based on um, rubrics, again, uh, from experts in the field and a panel of judges. The entries needed to demonstrate planning and research into effective community engagement, um, clear and concise communication, and success in achieving those goals and objectives. This is the district's second Spectrum Award by the uh, Wisconsin School Public Relations Association. Uh, we received another award in 2010 for communications related to the community engagement process around the development of the district strategic vision, HSD 2025. And I want to recognize the role that communications coordinator, Tracy Habish-Aline, and her leadership for moving our communications forward. And this reward is, award is a result of her leadership and work in this area. Tracy, can you come up and I'd like to present the award to you, please? Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mary. Next item on the agenda is, unless anybody has any questions for Mary on that? Okay. Next item on the agenda is the report section, and I'll turn it over to Corey McIntyre for a district and school safety and preparedness update. Well, thank you. In light of the recent school shootings in Connecticut, the, the Hudson School District is taking action to review our crisis preparedness plans in our schools. Tonight, I'll be providing to you an overview um, but we are not going to provide you with the specific details due to the sensitivity of, of the, the issue and, and for the protection of our students and staff. Uh, however, very specific work is being done, not only at the district level, but at every building in the district, and that will continue in the uh, you know, upcoming months. Uh, we have many safety and security measures already in place, uh, and, and we're just working to continually build and improve on those. Um, we're basically going to go through a process of evaluating what our needs are at this point. Uh, the preparedness uh, efforts are very important as it provides an opportunity for everyone involved to learn strategies to protect not only oneself but others that extend even beyond the school setting. In the document in your materials here you can see that uh, uh, research does indicate that a good uh, crisis plan really has four phases. There's a mitigation prevention step, preparedness, response and recovery. So we are working through those uh, phases of our, our building plans and district plans. And you can see on the bottom there are really the general review of our action steps that we've already initiated. We are basically going to be looking at uh, re revising our crisis plans for each building and the district-wide plan. Also looking at uh, school-specific preparedness and crisis plans, in particular safety and security measures in the buildings. Uh, that includes risk assessment of the facilities. We're in the process of, of completing that with facilities and ground staff. And then uh, as early as this week, we are beginning a series of meetings with coordinating our efforts with local first responders. Uh, that includes local law enforcement, sheriff's department, county emergency preparedness staff, and other EMS providers. So we're working hard to, to coordinate all those efforts and, and just continually find ways to improve on our, our preparedness for this and how we would respond in, in light of a crisis situation and there's a variety of those scenarios that we, we have to be prepared for. So tonight's really just to give you a brief update on, on that work that is being done. There's a lot of specific details happening, um, but it's really just to communicate that that went into effect very rapidly in light of the recent uh, tragic events in Connecticut. So I'll entertain any questions you may have. Board members, do you have any questions for Mr. McIntyre? Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the citizens' request to speak, and we have none. 
Um, next item is Topics for Action, 2013-14 Short-Term Space for Learning Plan for High School and Middle School. I'll turn it over to Mary. And I will provide the introduction and I would invite uh, High School Principal Laura Love to come forward, uh, Principal Dan Koch from the Middle School and Principal Susie Prather from Hudson Prairie to join me in this report to you. As you all know, uh, board members, we have uh, growing enrollment at both the middle school and the high school that exceeds the capacity of those buildings. And this, it is vital that we find a long-term solution that addresses that growing enrollment, supports our program, and also is one that our community can support. So in the meantime, since 2007, we have had short-term plans in place to address our growing enrollment. And this, in October, you uh, approved a plan to move on or uh, continue that short-term planning during this interim period. And so uh, with that, the planning process was an internal process for us to seek solutions from the staffs at both the middle school and the high school and to uh, consider those solutions for the administration of the three buildings we have in front of you, the administrators and the district administrators to work uh, on those plans and bring the uh, plan that best serves our short-term needs in, at this time. Uh, we all know that this can, these plans can only um, partially meet the needs that we have, otherwise they would be long-term plans. So they are the adequate plans for uh, meeting the needs and moving forward during this interim before we have a long-term plan in place. So with that being said, um, we've moved forward with a plan that we think works at both of the schools for the next year and actually extends a little further beyond that period. And I'm gonna turn it over first to Principal Love to talk about the high school and how that plan was developed and then what the um, pieces of that plan are. Uh, then we'll look at Dan Koch to talk about the middle school plan. Susie Prather will add on to that. And then Tim Erickson will talk about the financial impact of the plans that we're recommending to you this evening. Laura? Okay, so we, um, I held listening sessions in um, late October, early November, I can't remember exact date. And um, those listening sessions are typically held with faculty and other staff members to get, um, in this case, we were gathering ideas for sh the short-term solutions. And we estimate approximately 40 additional students based on the number of graduates in the senior class this year and the number of eighth graders uh, we expect to come to Hudson High School next year. We came up with uh, four solutions that we think will help alleviate some of our most um, dire areas. And uh, I, I believe these will, will really help us with um, getting through the next couple of years, hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna start at the top uh, with two additional uh, sections of students, essentially 40 more students or so. Um, we believe that the move um, that IT is amenable to would uh, give us two more classrooms. And at the same time, I'm gonna jump you down to bullet number four because these two things end up being somewhat connected. We are beginning freshman academies in the 2013-14 school year. And in the combination of a move of IT and putting in freshman academies essentially in the west wing, which is, um, if you're familiar with the high school building, from door five to door eight and that entire square of classrooms. This will limit the number of times that freshmen would move back and forth between the west side and east side. And we estimate to have three academies in the morning and three in the afternoon, which is approximately 240 freshmen who would not move between periods one and three from the west side to the east side. And again, 
240 or so freshman periods five through eight who wouldn't move. Additionally, we're looking at some of our math classes, which may not be part of the freshman academy, and then some of our world language classes that wouldn't be connected to the freshman academy, but essentially hold many of our freshman students and um, moving those classrooms to the west side as well. So the two of those, adding two classrooms to our space and putting all of our freshman academies on the west side of the building will help alleviate the number of students passing between the east and west side, which is a really big area of congestion. Um, approximately five to six times of passing a day, and that's at least 240 students less during those times. Additionally, a bottleneck area that has been major congestion based on the narrowing of a hallway um, that most of our students use to get from the east side to the west side is right at the entry of the LMC and those doors have to open outward. Um, so setting back the media center main doorway to um, not have those doors enter into an area of congestion will allow for um, less tension and stress in an area where the, the hallway narrows about four feet or five feet. Um, and then the, the last major issue at the high school is that we're really nearing fire code capacity of the cafeteria during the lunch period. We're approximately uh, between 560 and 580 students, students alone in the lunchroom during each of three lunch periods. And we can move our 25 minute advisory period to connect it to the fifth hour. And we actually need to do this because of the implementation of freshman academies. And that will allow us to have four lunch periods and we estimate that we would have no more than 440, say, students in the cafeteria during each of those four lunch periods. So those are the sort of creative ideas that our staff helped us come up with for the, the short-term solutions at the high school. I just want to add on to something Laura said. She talked about 40 more students anticipated at the high school. It certainly could be more than that. Um, that would be the minimum we would probably look at. Uh, Dr. Hazel Reinhardt projected a, a little over 100 more for next year. And then I know Nancy Sweet in the next one of the next reports also has another way to look at that as well. So um, we look at this as probably the minimum that we might expect at the high school that we need to plan for, for sure, and that this plan would also address the numbers if we would expect 100 more students as well. So we'll move on to the... Can I ask her a question? Um, sure. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned 240 freshmen. Um, approximately half of the freshman class would have the academy in the morning and half in oh, the I afternoon. Okay. So it's about 240 each of those. I was those. going to ask you what happened to the rest of the freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping there's still Thank there. you. So we'll move on to the middle school. Uh, Principal Koch. As you can see when you um, look before you, that we have a plan, okay? Uh, and I would describe the plan right now that it, it is adequate, uh, but it's certainly a far cry from uh, you know, a long-term solution, and that's actually what you know, we're looking for. We can implement this plan, uh, but um, it um, falls short significantly of what, of what we need, and I'm simply going to say to you uh, once again that we need a solution, uh, and um, we need basically as soon as we possibly can, can get one. I also want to say that in this process, um, our building, obviously, the, the issues that we have spill over into Hudson Prairie, uh, our neighbor, connected neighbor. So anything that we've had to deal with here, um, it has involved Prairie as well. Uh, and we've had you know, great cooperation, not because just Susie's sitting here right next to me right now, but we really have had, we've had great cooperation. We've had a lot of communication. Uh, we've had mutually agreed upon sort of rules and regulations as our students move over into Prairie and and I think she could probably attest to the fact that we've really not had uh, you know any significant issues but when the um, uh, when it became clear uh, you know in September that we were not going to have um, a long-term solution before us 
uh, we began right away uh, in October uh, planning for a short-term uh, solution again because I can tell you that we also, uh, I have uh, materials, as I'm sure many of you probably have if you look back, we have a presentation we made in, um, back in, uh, in October uh, of uh, 2011 uh, and excuse me, 2010, uh, again, for a short-term solution uh, that um, we facilitated part of it, but um, uh, we were not able to uh, obviously meet our needs adequately at that particular time. But anyway, um, as I said, in October, we began the planning process. And for us at the middle school, we have a site-based improvement team. It's a, a faculty team uh, that uh, represents all the various houses. And we did similar, a similar process to, to the high school. We did a brainstorming process. We asked faculty for any and all suggestions and opinions. And uh, we got quite a number of them, some very, very interesting ones, um, and sifted down through uh, those, um, uh, th that input, I should say to what we thought was workable. Uh, obviously, with our situation impacting Prairie, Susie and I had some conversations uh, you know, right away. And then it obviously uh, moved to the district level where we all put our heads together to try to figure out you know, what we were going to, uh, to do next. Um, you have the plan. Basically, you, you see the plan. And it, it really can be summarized you know, pretty simply. Plan A uh, is we're really going to sort of stand pat. Now, we currently have 1,307 uh, you know, students. Uh, that is our enrollment right now. The projection is for 1,349 um, as um, we move forward toward next year. Whether or not we realize that particular number, under or over, you know, either way, will certainly have an impact on, on what we will do next. But plan A, so to speak, is we will stand pat. We will use the classrooms that we currently have, and we will use the same three rooms that we have in Prairie as we have uh, this year. Um, and I think the year before, two years now that we've been doing this, uh, and uh, make no particular inroads into uh, Hudson Prairie. If, and this is you know the big uh, if here, we will monitor the student numbers, the growth numbers very, very closely. If it begins to exceed our anticipated uh, number, then uh, we have to move to plan B. Uh, and Plan B, uh, fundamentally, is once again moving into Hudson Prairie, uh, occupying more classroom space. Uh, the, the core uh, I, um, statistic here is obviously student growth. That's what we have to pay most attention to. We will watch our numbers very closely. We'll begin monitoring those this spring. We will look at that through the summer. But as you can probably understand, we're never really going to know exactly what those numbers are until the day they show up you know, for classes which means we could find ourselves you know, on the fly trying to make some adjustments if those numbers become too large. Uh, and that's the sort of the iffy part of the, the equation here. And we, we hope that isn't the case, but it certainly uh, could be. Uh, and depending on those numbers, then plan B also means that as, as we uh, get together and work out the details of um, space at Prairie, it doesn't necessarily mean we automatically use three rooms, again, making it a six, you know, a total of six. It means it might just be one, or it could be two. Uh, it could be uh, you know, somewhere up to three. If it goes beyond three, then we got a, we got a whole other issue <laughs> that we're, that we're going to have to deal with here. So basically, uh, you know, in a nutshell, we're going to stand pat this next year, try to absorb as much of the growth as we can. If the numbers come in uh, higher than we anticipate, then we would look at Plan B, which means we would move further into, into Hudson Prairie, uh, and we would be talking about how we can best, best facilitate that. The 2014-15 piece, I'm going to actually slide over to Susie because it's, it actually impacts her a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, just to add on to that, I know um, Nancy Sweet has monitored the numbers along with the middle school and looking at enrollments and um, paid attention with Dan as well to our class size guidelines and, and how those are impacted. So um, ha having as little impact as possible um, absorbing those students. Yeah, I guess I, I, it behooves me to say that we will continue to do what we have always done, and that is to try to deliver the curriculum in a high quality way. Uh, that uh, provides for quality educational experience for, for our kids. I mean, that's always our objective. What I hope you understand, and I, I, it's like preaching to the choir because I think I know you do understand, as these numbers continue to grow and we, as we continue to have less and less space, that challenge becomes more significant. It just becomes a greater and greater challenge. But uh, 
we will continue to do the best that we can do. Um, as Dan has said, we've had a good partnership with the middle school um, in the transition. Three years ago, we met with a committee of teachers where we really talked about um, what are our priorities at Hudson Prairie to make sure that our students are receiving that strong education at Hudson Prairie and what room is available. So um, in November, we started that conversation at Hudson Prairie on what kind of space is available at Hudson Prairie um, and really analyzing the numbers and the projected numbers of enrollment at Hudson Prairie along with Nancy Sweet and space availability at our school and we do feel confident we can provide three additional classrooms to the middle school as needed um, with those numbers there are some implications that would happen at Prairie and I want people to be aware of that and one of them is capping um, we want to make sure that we're maintaining our class size guidelines of 18 to 22 for primary students and um, 23 to 27 for our intermediate students and that is so crucial for the personalization um, and we just appreciate as a school the support we've had of, of the board with that. So what capping means is if we reach those high end of those guidelines, um, Nancy Sweet and myself and other principals look to other schools where there's room available and then we provide transportation to those families. So that would be an implication that we have been doing at the district um, for a lot of years um, as enrollments kind of fluctuate. Um, so that would be one of the implications that would happen to new families that move into Hudson Prairie um, area with that. And that would be just some of the class sizes um, in certain grade levels. Um, some other pieces that would be implications to us as our school, we would move our guidance lessons, Mr. Hansen teaches guidance lessons, into the classrooms, their regular ed classrooms. So that would, that would open up one room for the middle school. Um, and some other implications are that movement of classrooms where we'll have to do some rearrangement. Um, we do have a committee forming right now to really look and say um, where would we move classrooms to really best um, have educate our kids at Hudson Prairie to keep our pod area and some of the different intervention blocks that we have. So we have a committee that's starting and we'll be doing that planning together. And I am confident that we will continue the great partnership that we've had. And as Dan have said, has said, it's been very successful. Um, our teachers and the teachers of the middle school have really come together to really share the expectations. And every, every year, every trimester, when we get new kids, um, I collaboratively work with the teachers at the middle school to share our expectations for Hudson Prairie. And those students are so respectful. Our kids love, I mean, they'll, our kindergartners will stop and say, can you tie my shoe? And it's so great to see little eighth graders helping the kindergartners out. Um, and frequently they'll open doors for me and things like that. So it's been a great partnership and I'm confident that um, we can continue to that partnership. Um, as we think about the impact of this, um, and as the middle school grows over the next few years and it impacts Hudson Prairie, it also will impact our other elementary schools because new students from Hudson Prairie and those grade levels that are capped will be moving to the other schools. And we just have to keep that in mind. We did this and we have done this at various times throughout the year to a minimal extent, but we did do it quite significantly um, at EP Rock when Rivercrest opened. So this is um, a plan that we've had experience with before. It's worked as well as this kind of plan can work. And what it really does is it supports the, the students and families that are already at Hudson Prairie and maintains them there. And it also um, provides the best education and support for each of our students and then certainly for the staff and teachers that support them. So we'd be happy to take any questions you have. Well, I guess we should do the financial impact and then take questions. Okay, so you've heard <clears throat> the overview of the plan uh, of how to address uh, these short term, in the short term, the, uh, the growth at the uh, middle school and the high school, and now we get into the cost portion. And <clears throat> if, I, if, I, if I might, I'm going to talk about these in terms of two different costs. One is going to be uh, one-time costs, costs will, inter will incur only one time, and the other are going to be annual costs. And so starting with one-time costs, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this in general terms as a maximum number. Um, when we're looking at uh, things such as modification of the library media center entrance to reduce that bottleneck that's happening there, uh, when we look at uh, relocation of the IT and, and relocating uh, some technology equipment, those types of things, 
Now, those are the, those are the things that are one-time costs, and we're looking at a maximum uh, impact of the general fund of about thirty-four thousand. Um, if we move on to, uh, we'd also have an impact to the uh, food service or child nutrition fund. And um, as Laura mentioned, we'd be adding uh, one additional uh, lunch period there. And so that would require some additional staff time. Um, and that one will fall under the annual cost, but there'd be uh, some equipment that would go with that, some point of sale equipment that would need to be purchased. And we'd be looking at actually doing that at the high school and possibly adding a couple of point of sale systems at the middle school as well as they grow. Uh, they will also uh, have a need. Uh, we're, we're running many, many kids through that, through, um, uh, through a few stations, and we may need to look at how to reconfigure that to add two uh, more point-of-sale systems at the middle school. Uh, so those one-time, the, the one-time costs there are somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, eight to eight to ten thousand uh, dollars. So those are our one-time costs: thirty-four thousand impact of the general fund, and again, that's a maximum and then uh, around $10,000 uh, for our food service fund. Uh, and food service is uh, uh, mostly paid for uh, by user fees, okay? So now if we move on to the annual costs, and again, I'm gonna talk about the general fund first. Um, moving IT out, uh, we need to find some space uh, to lease. And uh, we're looking, when we look at in terms of market, um, and what lease rates are running, um, we're looking at somewhere, a cost somewhere around uh, $20, $26,000. And I, again, that's an estimate, and it's based on what uh, I'm looking at as far as cost per square foot to lease right now. Um, we'd also have, with IT, we also need to move and we'd have the need for some technology, some fiber optics, and so we would lease uh, fiber, fiber optic uh, line, and that's at about a rate of $300 a month. Uh, so we're looking at about a total of $30,000 per year impact to the general fund. Uh, again, that's an estimate. Um, we'll be coming back to you at a later date uh, once we uh, land on a space that will work for us and uh, come back, of course, with a lease agreement and that type of thing. And uh, then if we look at our annual costs to the food service fund, and again, that's really adding that, uh, that fourth lunch period at the high school, and that's approximately $9,000 of impact. We'd need to add some additional staff uh, time there for, to handle uh, that uh, additional lunch period. So any questions? Uh, just adding on to that, um, could be transportation costs as well as we move students um, from Hudson Prairie to the other elementary schools. Again, this is something that we've done in the past. And Nancy, could you just speak to that, um, the ability to avoid additional runs and um, the potential? Mm -hmm. uh, well, generally speaking, we have, um, we have buses for students across the district going to the Willow River Elementary Program because we have students being taken to St. Pat's and Trinity. So there are existing um, bus routes that could, uh, could pick up uh, students, new students, uh, to the Hudson Prairie um, uh, campus to Willow River. And again, we have to keep a close eye on the enrollments at Willow River too so we don't over enroll that school. Otherwise, um, we certainly look at the other schools as well. North Hudson is really a, a, a capping site now for Hudson Prairie uh, if, if we would need it. Um, and uh, particularly, we would look at bus routes close to, closest to the attendance boundaries for um, North Hudson. You know, where do the new students live? Where are the nearest bus, bus routes? And Safeway is um, awfully good at, at uh, finding the most efficient uh, route possible. Um, if it becomes more extensive, as it did just prior to the opening of Rivercrest, then, then it means the adding of additional bus routes. But we would not know that yet. But it can be done, and it has been done before in the district. Okay, thank you. Board member questions? Yeah, uh, Tim, can you tell me again what the lease rate is per month for the 
What you said, the broadband <coughs> line, or what, what kind of line, fiber optic line you said? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have you repeat that, Sandy. I didn't hear that. Okay. That. <laughs> what, I, I thought you said that the lease rate for the, was it a fiber optic line? Yes, Would be yes. 300 and something a month? About 300 a month, yeah, at least. But then you said $30,000 a year. So are, are those two are not connected figures? There's right. 300 the, a month. Those, a, yeah, those would be separate figures. The 30,000 would be the, the lease of space. Oh, 30,000 is the lease of the space. Right. And okay. we, yeah, we but what was the 26,000 then? Wait, 26 is the uh, lease of the space. 30 is the no. total. You're right. I'm sorry. It's oh, 20, okay. 26 for the lease of the space. That's correct. Got it. All right. Thank and then 3,600 for the fiber optics thank you. per year. Yeah. Other board member questions or comments? Madam President, I have a question. Um, just trying to get my arms around the this all this space that's available at at um, Prairie. Um, now, this isn't involving displacing any students. And uh, I mean, we're just talking about capping classes. Um, to that point, are these class sizes enlarging as we're grabbing more and more? classrooms from Prairie? Actually, the classes would be staying about the same because what we're doing is we're projecting the class sizes up. The way that okay. spaces are becoming available is last year, our incoming kindergartners were only three sections. It just happened to be that way. So when you okay. carry that cohort of three through, that, that leaves an extra classroom. Another opportunity, as I said, was the guidance that opens up another classroom. And then there's also the classroom guidelines when it changes from second grade to third grade. Second is 18 to 22, and 13 is 23 to 27. And that's typically a year in third grade when some of our four section class sizes go down to three to maintain those guidelines. So it really isn't changing where our guidelines are right now. We have, um, currently we have two that we're monitoring where we're at that 27 level at our school and there are three sections that we're monitoring and that's why when we get new students we look and say where do these new students um, live and we place them in schools that are you know with that have some room for it so it really wouldn't be any displacing of students where they are that's really the anomaly when you move those class sizes up um, where we gain some of those sections right now okay another question I have has to do with um, sort of the the intermingling of the elementary kids and the middle school kids is that is that working out all right I mean, yeah okay. and actually that was one of the um, big conversations that my staff had um, three years ago when we were having this conversation and we had about 12 different plans and the plan that we um, worked with if you walk into Hudson Prairie and take a left on that main corridor that connects right by the office those are the three classrooms that the middle school uses so if you think about that trans transfer it is a quick into the middle school those kids also use the restrooms in the middle school so there's no um, there's no um, interaction with the kids there um, so really it's kind of a straight shot so when we're planning on looking at additional classrooms it would be right in that main corridor and if you think about the travel for elementary kids there are a lot of other hallways where they go like to lunch and where they go to FIAD so there's really not a lot of intermingling you know the little bit that there is is if kids are going to the health office and they might see uh, the middle school there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other board member questions? I have one question for Susie and it's on capping. Does it impact families that are currently residents of Hudson Prairie or just families that are moving in, even though they're in the attendance area but not yet attending school? It would be just the new families. This is keeping all of the families that currently are at Hudson Prairie, it would have no effect. So it's just the move in families to the Hudson Prairie attendance area that would be affected with the capping. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, board members? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Brian, second by Dan. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is approved. Next item on the agenda is mm -hmm. AB 2012-13 wage and salary market adjustments for teachers, counselors, psychologists, social workers, physical therapists, coordinators, supervisors, and support employees. <laughs> Nancy Sweet. I think we've covered everybody. <laughs> I think so. Um, the, um, the finance committee on the 2nd of January and the personnel committee on the 7th of January have reviewed this material, the Finance Committee, more thoroughly, the 
cost analysis and the personnel committee more thoroughly um, the, the specific details uh, relative to the employee groups. Um, so I'll, I'll provide an overview and then get into more detail as board members might have questions. In December, um, you requested that the administration um, develop a plan and a cost analysis to bring um, or at least move um, employee wages and salaries either to or toward the median um, to reflect um, the um, comparability studies, the market analysis that um, um, you requested that we do earlier. We started the comparability studies last summer and began presenting them to the board um, in August and completed those studies and presentations in November and did some updating along the way. So all of, all of the, the plan is based on the data um, in the comparability studies. Um, and just um, to, to emphasize, um, the median um, is not the top of the wage or salary scale. It's, it's the middle or the average, but the median is the, is the um, correct term for what's used in um, comparability studies. Um, as we did those studies, you saw that numerous classifications are considerably below the middle or below the median. Um, some are at or near uh, the median, and a few of our employee groups or employees are over that median. Um, and the plan addresses um, those um, employees and employee groups that are below uh, the, the middle or below the, the median. Um, uh, the HR office um, did the um, gathering of the data on comparability for all of the employees with the exception of the administration. Uh, Fox, Lawson, and Associates um, have did independently um, the gathering of the comparability data for the administration. And you heard um, a presentation in November from Jim Fox on the administration data and both personnel and finance uh, recently um, heard from uh, Mr. Fox. Now he is not here tonight, but um, the, um, the recommendation that will be made uh, in this, it's a separate item, is based though on the data provided by Fox and Lawson. Um, the, I guess I'll ask at this point before I move into the teachers, I wanna start with the teachers because the teachers obviously for a public um, school system are the largest uh, group of employees and we have, um, we have patterned uh, the plan uh, after the teachers um, and so I would start there and I would ask Mary or Tim if you have any introductory comments before I kind of launch into that, either one of you. Well, I've said this at every committee meeting but I just uh, <laughs> think it's worth repeating that um, there are significant differences when we look at the comparability information and some of the wages and salaries that we have for staff. And uh, it could be um, misunderstood that we have been underpaying for some time, um, but yet that, that's not necessarily the case. It's more about uh, things changed when Act 10 was enacted in uh, Madison. And so it used to be um, ha has that the games, the, the rules of the game have changed. So for example, when you look at in the past, our um, total compensation, and let's just take teachers because it's the mm -hmm. easiest uh, and largest group, uh, total compensation involving both benefits and salary, when you add that together, um, it was comparable in Hudson to what was happening in Minnesota. Um, but at that time, the benefits in Wisconsin were higher than the benefits in Minnesota. 
but the salaries were just the opposite. So the salaries were higher in Minnesota for teachers and the salaries in Wisconsin were lower. As a result of Act 10, the investment that the Hudson School District was making on the benefit side was reduced. So it came down and it's much more mm -hmm. comparable to what it is in Minnesota. Now we go to the salaries and we're unequal um, and not comparable because the salaries are lower in Hudson and the salaries in Minnesota are generally higher. So that's really what has created the situation that we're addressing this evening and looking at comparability and where we are in relationship and um, how to uh, change that situation so we're more comparable in the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that as we uh, had worked on this project, um, you know, we're, we're passing a budget. We're, we're still, we were still working, obviously working on a compensation. And so what, what Nancy is presenting tonight is, has been budgeted for, it is in the budget. I just want to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, so you have, you have in the package of materials, you have a summary page, which would essentially be the cost analysis. And if you have questions about that, I'll refer those to Tim. But the detail um, is behind that. The other, the other um, preface that I would make is um, uh, just to recall the ratification of the teacher agreement back in um, December. And that was a, um, a bargained agreement, a collective bargaining agreement, having to do with the um, a CPI, cost of living um, agreement. And each of the uh, teachers, as a result, received individually a 2.66% salary increase. Um, and that um, was helpful uh, in the sense of application then to the comparability studies, which are, w this is not a cost of living proposal. This is a market adjustment uh, proposal based on the comparability studies. And that's why you'll see that um, in some cases um, the plan does not include um, the provision of additional market adjustment for certain employees and certain employee groups because the, they are above the, the median. Um, but the teachers, um, even with the 2.66, um, they, they were prior to that at all points, at the base, at the MA, and at the top, um, were below um, the median. The 2.66 helped those near the base rise to the median of the base. And then above that is really the market adjustment. And so moving into pages one through five of your materials, um, what we've presented here um, in the first column, it's the number of teachers at the contract level that is in the column uh, next to it. And the uh, full-time and that represents the contracted amount with the 2.66, which was the um, cost of living increase. And then it's a statistical continuum, and if, we, if I get into trouble here, you can help me out. <laughs> but it's a statistical con continuum then between those points in the comparability study. Again, that top which was, if you think of the old grid, that top wage, the middle with the MA and then the base, those are the points that we worked from and that financial services developed this statistical continuum in between. And so you, uh, you see arranged the um, number of teachers with the highest contract amount to the lowest. And in between is a statistical continuum of um, the gap that needs to be closed between their salary and that market adjustment. Um, and we weren't able, and we tried awfully hard one Friday night, Tim and Mary and I, we tried awfully hard to get it all the way, and we couldn't do it. 
um, again, with the amount that's in, in the budget. So what you see represented here is 40% to that median or that, or that statistical median in between the top, the MA, and the base. Um, so not all the way, but 40%. So in, in many cases, the teachers got the 266 cost of living, and then they all got that, and then on top of that, 40% of the market adjustment. Um, you'll see there's a cutoff, again, statistically determined. If you go further um, into page uh, two of five, um, the cutoff is um, within, if they were within $1,500 of that median, there was no market adjustment on top of the cost of living. Okay. Does that, that, that's the format, that's the template as we go forward with the other employee groups. Okay, and so then if you go back to the summary, um, the cost of that uh, market adjustment for the teachers is a little over 192,000. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna keep moving along and, until you say stop. So then we move into um, Um, the counselors, psychologists, and social workers, um, they, they are not uh, and never have been in the district part of um, the, the teacher's um, bargaining unit, but, but they have um, historically um, been treated in compensation like the teachers, so there's some long-standing practice. And, but they had their own comparables, if you could think back to the comparability report on counselors and psychologists and social workers, they do have a different um, wage scale in other districts as well. And um, we had to do that study based on the median because the number of days that these professionals work in schools varies so widely. It ranged from 183 to 204. And so we had to base it on a median, so you'll see on on that page, that colored page, you'll see um, in, in, in the bottom, in that white area, uh, the 215 is the base, uh, and, that, and that's at an MA level because these uh, particular um, certified employees um, must be, have a master's degree in order to be licensed to work in the schools. So it starts at 215 and the top is, three, is 388. And similar to the teachers, you'll see the same format here. The 266 applied to the per diem, you know, versus the total salary, although the total salary is calculated all the way to the right. And then at a certain point, there's a cutoff, again, statistically determined, where um, a 40% market adjustment is, um, is um, recommended. Uh, from 54 cents to three dollars and 67 cents per diem. Again, it doesn't take any of the employees all the way, but it takes them 40 percent to that um, market um, median. Okay. Smaller group, um, certainly smaller than uh, the five pages of teachers there, because <laughs> each of these lines represent one one individual. Okay, moving into um, coordinators and supervisors, um, and these are um, specific people. These are one one person per per uh, position, um, and um, you'll you'll see a little bit more comment here because they they do have um, um, very um, unique um, from each other uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, but for example, if we just take the financial services manager as a, an example, um, the uh, salary, 66,000, the median uh, is 74,401. If we uh, apply the 266, um, the market adjustment amount that remains is the 6,645 and 40% of that is 2,658. So again, not all the way to the median, 
but uh, the uh, recommended salary would be uh, 70,414. I'll make a comment, the communications coordinator, um, we, we're not um, recommending any um, market adjustment there. Earlier this year, we um, uh, and the board approved um, a, um, a realignment of community education and facility scheduling into the communications coordinator position, and we adjusted the wage at that time. We are suggesting a change in title. You can see that to more to reflect uh, the new um, and broadened uh, responsibilities. Okay. And I won't take the time to go through each and every one of these unless you have a specific question. Uh, um, at, uh, I, will, I do want to add something here because at um, uh, personnel last night, there was a question about the school to career coordinator, and we do have some additional information. Um, the position is, it isn't reflected on the sheet here, so I'm just going to uh, mention to you some additional information. Uh, Hudson School District is the fiscal agent for this position. This person also serves um, uh, another district, has served more than one district in the past, um, but receives a state, we receive a state grant, and that state grant currently is in the amount of $30,000, and currently 16,000 of, of the 30 um, is uh, to offset the salary of this person. Okay, um, the remaining fourteen thousand of that grant um, is um, for program. It's it's for student activities. It's for materials. It's for training. Um, and uh, there was a question about whether or not we needed um, to to partner with another district. And I'll ask uh, Sandy Kovach, who really oversees this uh, particular position and this program. To if respond I look to at that. the requirements of the 2012-2013 Youth Apprenticeship Grant, it does state in there it needs to be one or more school districts, but then there's an or, any combination of one or more school districts, other public agencies, nonprofit organizations, individuals, or other persons. So it may not have to be another school district, but we could also, in the future, partner with other organizations, obviously both mm -hmm. public or nonprofit in order to receive the grant. Many of the smaller districts look for a partnership though because one of the requirements is um, to have at least 12 students in the program. So that's part of the reason for some of the smaller districts mm -hmm. partnering with uh, a larger district such as Hudson. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything? Okay. Then uh, moving on to um, the support employees and there are multiple Class, oh, I don't want to move on yet. I, I forgot something under coordinators and supervisors. Um, and Sandy, you can come in on this if you'd like. They're currently in process an ITS uh, audit, okay? And we do not yet have the results of that audit, and the audit might suggest uh, some reorganization. Correct. In the next mm -hmm. couple of weeks, we do expect the initial recommendations, and then we'll bring a, f a formal report to the board. But we are anticipating some recommendations that may lead to, uh, as Nancy just mentioned, some reorganization within mm -hmm. the department. So we've held out some of those people until we can bring that as mm -hmm. a total package. Mm -hmm. So, so on the coordinator supervisor page, there are some positions associated with ITS that are not reflected here. They're not forgotten. Um, we're just holding um, those um, recommendations uh, relative to market adjustment in abeyance until we hear uh, the results of the um, audit and, and the people in that department know that. They know that uh, this is happening, okay? And so similarly, you will see the IT uh, specialists uh, missing from the support uh, list that we're gonna go through next. Okay, and that's a two-page uh, two page document here. Um, this, um, uh, this, this we approached differently and we're recommending uh, differently. Um, these are all hourly wage employees. And um, 
we are recommending um, instead of a 40 percent toward the median or 40 percent market adjustment we are recommending that in one year that um, that the board bring uh, employees who are below the median up to the median up to the middle and so you'll you'll see variously and and these employees include our custodians campus monitors mail delivery school age care administrative assistance our secretarial employees um, educational assistance health assistance media nutrition services and ot ot and pt assistance okay but you will see that in some areas again given given the the plan direction that we received um, there are some employees um, who um, are already at median or above so they are not represented here as um, recommended for a market adjustment the uh, behi behind this though and it's not I don't think it's on the plan in the in the um, I didn't see it in the financial but if you'll remember um, the the steps you see with the support employees there are steps so the first three years and the next and the next this is very near and dear to our support employees because um, after three years there is a there is an additional um, um, hourly wage increase that is um, considered significant and we have held that the district gave a 1.48 percent um, last year to everybody in the support domain and um, held the steps and um, the, the costing Tim the um, costing does provide for um, the step increases for those people that previously were frozen right yeah if anybody who would be eligible mm -hmm. to move that step yeah. would move yeah. those in this plan yeah so there are individuals who in the market adjustment will not receive an increase but are going to receive an increase because they're eligible for steps okay um, that is the that's the um, recommended plan and cost analysis do you want to uh, do anything Tim overviewing this um, page here differentiating the funds or anything like that or whatever well, the board I think needs. we've got the we've got the funds differentiated on that uh, first page mm -hmm. on a summary um, and we can take a look at that uh, if you don't have any questions on the detail go ahead Cindy I have a question on um, the counselor psychologists and social workers page okay what page is that Sandy oh, the third one down I um, mm -hmm. the one with the yellow on it yeah, it would be page six in the sequence. Mm -hmm. The third one down, the third guidance counselor down, it's a full-time employee, 74505, and then it carries over to the 2012-13, and it goes mm -hmm. down to 65,000. Can you explain yeah. why that's the only um, one that does that? Yes, yes, because if you look at the FTE, the full-time equivalency, okay. it's a 90% it's a position. But in order to do the statistical... Um, uh, calculation of the median uh, we had to um, calculate the salary as if it was full-time first right. and and then um, the contracted amount though reflects the full-time equivalency FTE okay yeah all right thank you mm -hmm. that explains it okay other board member questions or comments for Nancy go ahead Dan. madam president just a question regarding um, with a lot of these we're looking at a 40 percent market adjust adjustment but we don't necessarily have a plan in place for you know bringing them up to mm -hmm. the full mm -hmm. that's just sort of based on uh, yeah. you know budget and well that's that's mary's question isn't it <laughs> mary has spoken to this a number of times so okay. it'd be good for mary to address that yeah. Certainly, we know that um, we are, we've done the comparability mm -hmm. studies, and we believe administratively that our employees need to be at the median. And uh, we know that um, in this recommendation, only some employees reach the median. Some are already there. Uh, some, our support staff, would be there based on, on this recommendation. And then um, our certified staff uh, would not be all the way to the median. 
So when we look at um, the biennial budget, which is to come in the next two years, and the uncertainty of what the revenue could be there, um, we are not making a promise about what happens in the subsequent years until we know what that budget looks like. And certainly that will be another decision you will make. But we've talked about this in relationship to moving towards the median. And we are able to, in this recommendation, move support staff to the median and um, certified staff towards the median. And we would hope that over time we would be able to um, uh, decrease that gap. Uh, we wish we could do it this year, but there are not enough funds available to do that. So over time, we're hoping that that could happen, but that's a dis future decision of the board and there is no promise in that. It's just um, something that we would like to accomplish. Um, and the, the only thing I would add to that, and it, it's perhaps self-evident in the comparability study, but all of the other districts and employers um, have raised the hourly wages and salaries of their employees. So we have to think about keeping up and at the same time uh, maybe continuing as best we can um, to close that gap. Thank you, Nancy. Any other board member questions or comments? Uh, if not, I have a comment. Okay. <coughs> So I spoke last time, we talked about uh, the desire to get to the median. And uh, um, so my comments are around the kind of the assumption of getting to the median and, uh, um, you know, in the backdrop of the economy and some of the challenges that are, uh, um, and I know we all share this, uh, that, uh, you know, trying to, trying to make those trade-offs. And the challenge we have is that we made some decisions as a school district to help us uh, to help us work through this economy. Uh, back in '09, we did a zero percent pay increase, which was not something we wanted to do, but we felt like we didn't want to increase class sizes by doing layoffs. So we want to make sure that we retained our, all of our teachers and the rest of our staff. So we made a lot of decisions that that may have hurt us and put us put us behind a little bit in. Compar comparability, but we also made a commitment that we're going to, you know, continue to invest in our in our programs, provide you know, collaboration time, and so I think you have to also look at the backdrop. If and you know, I haven't got into the details on maybe some of these comparable districts, but it'd be interesting to know what is their class sizes, right? Have they have they sacrificed class sizes for, you know, maybe maybe they're above us in terms of median pay, but maybe the class sizes are bigger. And uh, so, again, you know, in a, in a maybe a different time and space, I could support this. But uh, my challenge is this: uh, for me personally, th this is m the wrong time to m make a market adjustment. And I, I hope that the you know all the administrators and um, and support staff and teachers who are either here or they're w watching understand that. For me personally, it's. Not, so, not a decision I make lightly, and, and I understand the challenge, but I also, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to look at the overall picture and, uh, um, and put that in perspective. So it was, that's my comments. Any other board member comments? Yes, please. Sandy? Um, I have expressed concern about doing this at the last meeting and when it was before the personnel committee before. I voted no on the concept. I still back my no vote on the concept. I agree with Brian that, that I, I just believe that this is an inopportune time to try to do this. Um, I have no problem with the attempt. I just believe this is not the correct time to do it due to the economy and the state of the economy for the last five years with, uh, truthfully, not much hope of it improving very much going forward. So I would um, I register my opposition to the idea of doing this. Okay, thank you. Mary? Madam Chair. Um, Tim, this money is already budgeted in the budget, so nothing changes as a result of this. This is already calculated and um, already there. So what happens if we don't use this money? Uh, if we don't use the money, it uh, goes into fund balance. Okay. 
Any other board member questions, Sandy? The fact that this money has already been budgeted doesn't mean we have to spend it. It can go into a fund balance or it could go towards uh, lowering a levy next year. It doesn't have to be spent. And I question how it got there. Uh, in October when we passed the budget, we didn't have this information, but at the personnel meeting last night when we questioned, is the money there, you said yes because we went up 3.16% in the wage pool and we only gave the teachers 2.66, so there's extra money to do this. I really argue with the concept of because there's extra money, we have to spend it. Thank you, Sandy. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess I, oh, well, you know, I think, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, when we're creating the budget, uh, we're, we're creating the budget months in advance. Uh, the final, you know, this final, the final plan was not finished until after the budget. So we have to, in any budget, you have to make estimations. Uh, that's just the way it is. We don't have, we make estimations all the time in our budget for all sorts of things. Uh, because some things are not finite and exact, so it's a projection. Uh, but as we built that budget, we realized we would probably need to look at uh, increases, and so as we built that budget, we built around that, and um, we worked hard to try and craft this to make sure we stayed within the budget. Madam Chair. Mary. Um, Tim, during that time period from the time the budget was built to was actually certified in October, there were a lot of changes going on within the state of Wisconsin. In fact, um, the CPI that was used for negotiations was 3.16 and it was very questionable about how we had to calculate the um, raise even if it was 3.16 and what it was going to cost us. So if I remember correctly, um, we needed to estimate that in the budget at 3.16 because of the uncertainty in Madison about how that was going to be calculated and there were multiple scenarios about how that could happen. So um, that kind of, if, if I'm correct and just let me know uh, about that, um, that's, that's how the budget plan was developed. Right. When we or, when we right, we looked at when we looked at the Act Ten and the impact it had, not having you know not having all the information, and also there are three different cases working through the courts. Uh, there's there weren't a lot of answers, and so we have to do the best we can on the information that we've got at the time. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the three point one six effectively, when we go through and negotiate uh, the teacher's contract effectively was a 2.66 percent. Madam, Madam Chairman, I, I understand that and I understand how budgets are done and I understand that there are, there are suggested figures. There, there are figures that you have to have because in order to create a budget you have to have figures. You miss my point when I say, you and Mary both miss it, that it's in the budget. It was put in the budget because we thought we probably needed it there, but we don't need to spend it by creating something like this right now in such a horrible economy. That's my only point, that we don't need to spend the money just because it's a budgeted item. And think of how nice that would be if we could say to the public, well, we had $400,000 in the budget, but we didn't have to spend it. We're going to do something else with it, perhaps lower the levy for next year. That's my only point. Um, Madam point? President. Pat. Okay, um, we have asked teachers, principals, to do a lot of work in our school district over the past five years and they have stepped up to do that and our school and our children are receiving an education that is better than it was and um, we put a lot of time, we put a lot of money into educating and bringing forth this result. The teachers, we have invested in them a lot. And if they're going to move on because, because their wages are better someplace else and more school systems are starting to do the system that we have here, 
so they don't have to invest too much in their education, so they would easily take our teachers. Now, what do we want to do? Spend more money to educate new teachers or to spend probably a little less to keep our teachers? And I feel that the, they're living, I don't know, are, are, they should be able to live in the district that they teach in. That's all my belief is, and I feel that they, they deserve this. We, um, because the whole group only got, what, two, what was the whole group that, 2.66 is what we, um, and the cost of living went up 3.1. So the whole group, everybody got the 2.66. So we had then <coughs> money from that 3.1 that we budgeted to bring forth the group that wasn't, to bring them closer to the median. Others were there, they didn't get, they aren't gonna get this raise because they already are there. So they're not gonna get that raise. Others will be, there's, there's um, 231 teachers that will not be getting any of this, this raise because they're already there. They're already up to that median almost. So, and so there's 160 and then we have the support groups and stuff. They're gonna get some and others won't. I think we can use that 3.1 that we budgeted and use it here. Thank you, Pat. Any other board member comments? I guess my comment is, and I'm gonna dovetail a little bit off of what Brian said when you were talking about um, asking the employment groups to take a freeze. Um, I guess my biggest concern and why um, I, I do support the plan is I don't know how we're gonna catch up if we don't start biting off this now. Um, <laughs> we've budgeted for it, we've planned for it, you know, the, the employment group agreed to a, a raise and we're able to try to make up some of that difference. I don't, I don't wanna have to come back to the taxpayer three years from now and say, you know, we're losing people. People are leaving because we aren't a competitive employer and now all of a sudden the gap is too big to chew off and the tax increase is substantial. So that's my opinion. One more comment. Sandy. You made the, a comment about the teachers group um, approving of, of the raise. You made some comment about the teachers group approving of the raise. I don't think they've approved of this. They, were, they approved of the 2.66, mm -hmm. correct? Right, yes. So their, their approval of what we did before has nothing to do with this, right? That's correct. Thank you. Madam Chair. Mary. You know, we are a people business, and how we serve students is through our people. And this represents our people, and the primary cost that we have as a district is in our people and investment into those people. I think it would be short-sighted for us to not say that our staff and the um, results that they are achieving with our students each and every day and their commitment to that is not worth the median when we have those dollars um, budgeted. I share the concern about people in our community um, and those that are um, struggling because that, that's very significant. We have staff who are struggling as well and um, I think we need to be uh, understanding of that and we also need to think about what is the impact if we have teachers who leave us for additional dollars or administrators who leave us or support staff who leave us because all they have to do is stay, they can live in the same place and all they have to do is go across the river and they have significant increase. We're not asking for them to be paid at the highest. We're, ask, we're not even asking for most of them to be paid at the average. So I think that if we think about that, you know, when I talk to people in the community, what they talk about is they do want our staff paid and paid. Um, you know, I don't know what well is, but they do care about how much our staff receive. And, um, you know, I think I would share the concerns even more if, this, if these dollars weren't in the budget already. And um, so just my opinion on it. Other board member comments, Brian? 
I want to let my other board members speak that I haven't spoken yet. Uh, They're not here. <laughs> so, so um, Mary, my only comment to that is I, um, is I also would look at those school districts that that um, may be attractive from a from a compensation standpoint. Are those same school districts in, investing as much in the in the curriculum and the program, and balance that out? And um, I know firsthand some of the districts that may be paying more, but I also know s the size of some of those classrooms that they're teaching in. And so, you know, there's there's only so many dollars to go around, and uh, so so I don't want to I don't want to say that I'm being short sighted or, or that um, I don't. Uh, um, that this isn't a decision that's challenging to make, but I also want to say that I, I'd rather invest in curriculum and you know, you know, there's those dollars and make sure that we're investing in our children um, versus uh, you know, doing a, you know, a market adjustment right now in, in the current economy, so. Thank you, Brian. Madam Chair. Dan. Um, I would be sort of curious, as Brian alluded to, is um, a couple of our fellow board members aren't here, Mark Kaiserschott, who's the chair of the personnel committee and, and our president, Tom Holland. Do, do we have any, um, have, have they commented on this as it relates to the committee work that they're involved with? Um, I talked to Mark today as well. He was uh, attended, chaired the personnel committee and um, endorsed this plan uh, individually. And then Tom Holland attended the finance committee. And I believe those who uh, were there could attest to he was, he made a statement that he didn't think this was enough. Mm -hmm. He said, I wish we could do more. Okay, thank you. Um, I personally think it's a laudable goal for us to try to get to the median. Um, as to Brian's point about the economy, um, I'm not sure if we'll ever get to this super robust period in, in being able to, you know, meet this, this need fully. But uh, as Lynn pointed out, I do think it's something we should work towards to gr try to get to um, the median and to be somewhat competitive with what we pay our, um, our staff. So, but I, I struggle as well, given the environment, but um, if the budget allows and we can, you know, make some inroads towards getting to that medium level, and as you can see, we're looking at, you know, just getting a 40% with, with a lot of these different individuals. So obviously we're not there, but uh, if we can, we can start working towards getting there. I guess I would support that. There's no any, no other questions or comments. I'll entertain a motion. Motion by Dan. Second, Second by Pat. Roll call vote, please. Pat, you can start. Um, German, yes. Colonel Hoy, aye. Robson, aye. Gerke, no. Bell, no. Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is 2012-13 Administrator Compensation, Nancy. Yep. You have um, a much shorter document here, just a two-page uh, summary uh, of the cost analysis um, and then a list of the positions. Um, the, and if you look at the detail maybe first. <laughs> Horizontally, <laughs> if possible. <laughs> okay. Are you able on your computers to see? I know you are, because you, I saw you. Oh, everybody got it? Okay. All right. Um, the, um, as I said before in the introductory comments to the other um, comparability um, recommendations, um, this data was gathered by uh, Fox Lawson and Associates. The market uh, median salary data was gathered by them. Um, but we have in our recommend, recommended plan, um, we are again paralleling um, the other employees um, with a, a recommendation 
that each of these positions, and you can see the number, um, they're each one person with the exception of six elementary principals, um, uh, two high school associates, uh, two middle school associates, um, but you can see the number of individuals there. Um, but we're recommending first an application of the 2.66 or to the median. If the 2.66 were to exceed the median, then it would be less than that. And then for, for those positions that have still a gap to the median, um, a 40% adjustment um, is recommended. Um, and then the recommended 2012-13 uh, salary um, is, is on the right. Um, this uh, list um, uh, does not include the superintendent because the superintendent um, negotiates her contract um, independently uh, with the board. Uh, the HR director, which is me, at least for now, <laughs> um, and I have had other duties, uh, assistant superintendent duties, the, um, <coughs> the median salary represents an HR director does not represent an assistant superintendent, just for some clarification. Um, and in our analysis, you'll see down in the notes that we are recommending that we maintain a 5% differential between the middle and the high school associate principals. That's been in place uh, for many, many years, and, and uh, the um, study that um, Fox Lawson did combined the two and averaged them but you would find in other districts that there is a, dif a differential. And Tim, do you want to speak to the, the, the cost analysis here? Uh, sure, you can see the summary on the other, on the other page is uh, $103,000, and that's both uh, for the general fund and uh, special education fund. So I guess we'd discussion or comments or Any board questions member questions or, or comments? Mr. Bell? Madam Chair, sure my, my previous comments uh, are germane to this conversation too, so I won't uh, restate them. Thank you. Sandy? Uh, mine also. I feel the same comments that I would have made before would, I would make on this. Okay, thank you. Other board member questions or comments? Pat? I'll, I'll just reiterate we have a very great staff and um, they've been doing a lot of hard work and if we have to replace any, we'll probably have to replace them at even higher than what we're going to be giving them as a raise, or as as placed as a raise, so. Thank you. Dan? For the reasons I stated earlier, um, we're not proposing getting all the way, but partially, and I can support that. Okay, thank you. Mayor? Um, Madam Chair, uh, I just, I think it's important that our uh, community, as well as our board, and as well as our teaching staff and support staff know that um, there is a plus and a minus about it being a high performing uh, district that affects the administrative team. And that is that um, they tend to be recruited uh, by other districts. And we certainly have that going on and it makes it very difficult for us to remain competitive if, again, just like um, our teaching staff and our support to that staff that I talked about before, if we don't remain competitive. And um, this does not bring us to that level, but it certainly is helpful. And I do um, know that as we think about the teaching staff and support staff in our schools and our districts, they need a high level of support to do the work that we expect of them and the level of accountability that's expected in this district and also in the state of Wisconsin. And um, they need support to do that as well. So when I look at this, and I also think of recruiting an HR director, I am very concerned about the dollars that we are going to have available and will that be enough to actually recruit someone at the caliber that we're looking for for the Hudson School District. Thank you, Mary. Any other board member questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I, s I second. Moved by Dan, second by Pat. All those in favor say uh, aye. Uh, roll call vote, please. 
We'll start with Dan this time. Roll call. Robson, I. Gerke, no. Bell, no. German, yes. Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is open enrollment timeline in regular education and special education space availability with Nancy and Nancy Sweet and Corey McIntyre, please. Another easy one. <laughs> Okay, you've got you've got a number of materials uh, that were made available to you in the in the board book, and I, I first of all just want to um, uh, identify the open enrollment uh, time period to you and to any member of the public who might be listening. Uh, the open enrollment uh, period of application extends from February four to April thirtieth. Um, and actually, there's even a specific time, 4.30 p.m. on April 30th, and um, interested non-residents can make application um, online or, or in pa paper form as well. You will not be making a decision, though, on specific um, applications until the May board meeting. So tonight, you're not making a decision on the specific applications. We're just announcing um, the open enrollment dates, and um, we became aware of a change um, in the law, um, the statute, the Wisconsin statute associated with open enrollment, which now, um, unlike the past, now requires school boards at their January meeting, specifically at their January meeting, to um, uh, determine the number of regular education and special education spaces or seats available within the school district for full-time open enrollment. Um, so that's what you're acting on tonight. It, it's, it's difficult to project, but uh, we'll do the best we can here to show you some data to be helpful. But for a district like ours that is growing, um, this is difficult for many districts in the state of Wisconsin that are declining enrollment. It's an easy, it's easy to do. Um, but nevertheless, we are by law, you are as a board required to, to make that determination tonight. Um, I want to just, um, before moving into some of the data, um, just um, to um, call your attention to certain um, Im important pieces of the open enrollment policy, the Hudson Board of Education policy number 5109, which you also have in your, your board materials. Um, because the decision, the, the decision you make tonight um, about the number of seats or spaces available and where they're available is going to, is going to be connected to um, the decision that you'll make um, in May. Um, and the statute, the Wisconsin statute, indicates that the board's full-time open enrollment policy should clarify what the district will consider when making these space availab availability determinations. And in our policy um, under um, Roman numeral two, B, um, the specific criteria are identified. The availability of space, I'll just read it because it's short. The availability of space in the schools, programs, classes, and grade levels may be based on optimum class size. That would be in reference to our class size guidelines. Student-teacher ratios, similarly related. Instructional factors. Um, building capacity, number of students attending the district for whom tuition is paid, and uh, enrollment projections um, established uh, by the, by the uh, district administrator or by an expert uh, presenting to you. Um, the, the other piece I want to call your attention to, which has been a struggle, uh, in the, it, it will continue to be, is uh, Roman numeral 2F, the district will give preference to non-resident students and to siblings of non-resident students who are already attending school in this district only 
if space is available in the schools, programs, classes, and grades. No preference will be given if no space is available uh, for open enrollment in the greater program. And I have to, I have to go back to um, to last year, um, just as a way of context here. Um, these decisions have been difficult and at times emotional because they are specific individual specific children. Um, but it is a difficult and emotional responsibility of the board. Um, the last year, the vote on the specific student applications was four to three. It was a split vote um, on a motion um, that despite the lack of space at the middle school and the high school, the motion was to admit um, those non-resident students already attending and to admit some students at the elementary level to grades where space existed. And um, one or more of the no votes was despite space available at the elementary to not admit any open enrollment students. Um, a non-resident not currently attending fifth grade going into sixth grade student whose application was rejected based on no space available appeal to DPI and after significant attorney fees, our district's attorney fees, and staff time on the district's part, um, we fought back as well as we could. Um, the, um, the appeal um, prevailed. And this student um, denied uh, applica en enrollment is now attending the middle school. The DPI attorneys found that the board's decision to admit currently enrolled students um, with siblings when no space was available was, um, and their legal term is arbitrary and unreasonable, and a violation of the district's own policy. And because of this, um, DPI communicated to the district that any other appeals of denied applications at any grade level would be upheld. Now, um, the, uh, the uh, parents of denied students have only 30 days to file an appeal and no one did. So we were fortunate, but um, what, what this meant was that anyone who filed, because DPI ended up viewing the decision that was made as um, arbitrary and unreasonable and a violation of our policy, they would just automatically admit those students. So we have to be, I do this just so that we be very careful to, in this um, difficult and um, emotional uh, time to follow our policy. And, and the other thing is too, if, if we say no, if you say no to, um, to deny enrollment where space is available, that also upon appeal would be viewed as as um, arbitrary and unreasonable and indefensible on our part. So now have I gotten myself into a lot of trouble here, <laughs> but I, I'm just, I just want to present you know, the context here and then we'll just move forward. Any questions at all? Comment? Mr. Bell? Mm -hmm. So I, think, I just think we have a difference in opinion in the interpretation of the district policy. So um, I was one of the no votes last time Mm -hmm. And I, I still think that, uh, that this policy is, uh, can be interpreted um, two different ways. I think the interpretation of um, that is there space available in the school, mm -hmm. I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's up for interpretation. Mm -hmm. And to me, space available means mm -hmm. that if we make a commitment for a student to uh, uh, enter elementary school, there's no, we have no space in the middle school. We just talked about that. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I still think there's a different, I, I still think there's a, you can interpret this policy two different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna show you um, three different um, 
uh, projections because remember one of another criteria is um, projected growth okay and and we'll make a suggestion to you on a very on the most conservative um, um, data but data based never nevertheless um, the other part of the policy that is discretionary though and, and one could avoid the emotional part of this is that um, districts don't have to have admitted students reapply. Now, years ago when this law came into effect and when we first developed the policy, when the board then in place developed the policy, because the district has always been a growing district, it was thought that it was in the best interest of the district to require via policy for open enrolled students to reapply at the next level. That's where it's become so difficult. It's so hard to say no to a student who's been here their whole career. But it is possible for once admitted to just finish. Uh, but don't know that that would be in the best interest of a, a, a district that's growing. Okay, so I'll show you the data and then you'll see, you can see what you wanna do with it, okay? Um, let's see here, okay, let's look at high school. And um, there's three different um, sets of data here, and I'll go through it. The first is the actual enrollment as of January 4th, 2013, just moved forward a grade, just taking the students that are actually in place and moving them forward. Um, and you can see for the high school that that total is 1722. I would call your attention to note number one because the average over six years, the average number of Hudson resident students who enter Hudson High School in the ninth grade um, from St. Pat's is 34. Now they aren't, they aren't currently enrolled as eighth graders here, they're enrolled in the private school. But over, over six years, it's usually around 34. So if you add 34 um, to the figure in the first column, you get 1756. The um, next set of data, and all of this data, by the way, is, is derived from documents that have been presented to the board in the past. So you have seen um, in annually uh, what the percent of growth has been at the high school, the middle school, the elementary. So this second column is just an average of those three years. And the average percent of growth in three years at the high school has been a plus 1.13%. Now last year, the high school grew 2.69%. But it's an average of the past three years. So if you anticipate growth at that rate, your numbers um, change and your bottom line is about 1742. Then we take in the third column, we, we look at demographer Hazel Reinhardt's um, material and we have had a practice of looking at the low, low projections. These are the most conservative of her several uh, projections. And isn't it something how close those are across if you look? Look at 11th grade, 401, 406, 406. But bottom line, um, you've got three different sets of data to look at to determine uh, what, you, what the projected growth would be. The um, note number three, the official count this year was 1709. So 1709 compared to 1722 or 1756 probably. 1742, 1789, with a seat capacity at the high school of 1680, um, the overcapacity is calculated at at least 42 students and perhaps 109. It's called seat capacity rather than building capacity because that's literally the seats in classrooms, but it doesn't, the core space is much less than that. You, you all know the narrow hallways and everything that um, Laura's talked about. Um, note number two, just for clarification, uh, 
includes resident students open enrolled and tuition waiver non-resident students. Uh, that's true for the first column, but not the second or the third. But, but uh, when Mary presents some of the data on official count, that's resident students always, but, but my office has to look at the seats. We have to look at the, the actual bodies of kids in seats, and so you have to count these kids that are here um, non-resident for tuition waivers or open enrollment. So overcapacity, uh, uh, grade levels all projected to be above 400. Moving on to middle school, then um, the same, same uh, kind of data. Move forward, uh, 1295 for the middle school, but if you add in the average of the 17 students over the past six years who've come in from the private schools, in the sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, um, it's uh, the more likely number is 13, 12. And um, the average, 2.62%, uh, uh, over three years, it's been as high as 4.3% at the middle school. But taking the average, uh, the number would be 1329. <coughs> and if we look at Hazel's projections, again, uh, fairly close. Fairly close, kind of interesting. Uh, 1349. So looking at the building capacity of 1125, we're over capacity at least by 170 to 224 next year. Okay. And I'll just move on to elementary. Um, the, the elementary uh, grades in the first column here, again, just moving the existing students forward. Um, kindergarten number is, uh, is an average of the official third Friday in September kindergarten student count. We don't know what that number is really going to be. February 5th is registration. Um, we know historically that it tends to be a low number. Then there's orientation later and more kids and over the summer. So the best we, we can do to provide this to you is just take the average of the last three years, 426. So estimated um, 2541, it, the average growth um, at the elementary is, is uh, it's a plus four-tenths of a percent. Okay, we've had some some down years where we've had a minus too. Just recently, uh, there's some trending up with the demographer, but just looking at the, th the average three year, we would have 2551, and then we have Hazel's um, low, low projections for your consideration. Okay. The official K-5 count uh, this year in September was 2559. And um, the elementary building total capacity, adding them all together, is 2940. So we do have um, a range of 238 to 399 remaining student seat capacity. And then here's a formula for your consideration because we do look at it by grade level. And, ag and again, what we did was we took the grades and moved them forward in the buildings and um, and then uh, projected the with the class size guidelines the number of sections that would be needed within those guidelines and an example here uh, grade 3 19 pro projected sections times 27 27 is the highest um, in the guideline uh, equals 513 seats. If you look back up at the top, there's 440 students moving into third grade. And then that, so you minus that, you get 73. If you take the, um, the growth of 0.4, you minus two seats. If you take Hazel's um, projections, you minus 43. So there's either 30 or 71 seats available for open enrollment. 
Um, if we look at down below that same analysis by grade, we have in grade five, 84 to 96, grade four, 20 to 45, grade three, 30 to 71, grade two, minus seven to 23, grade one, minus 49 to 11, and kindergarten would be minus nine to minus eight. And I'm gonna have Corey um, now talk about special ed before we recommend uh, a board motion and then you can have a discussion about it. <laughs> okay, so thank you. So when, you, when we're considering special education uh, availability for open enrollment, a few things I want to remind you of uh, how we make our decisions. Uh, three years ago, I believe we had uh, board approved caseload uh, and service load guidelines similar to class size guidelines for our, our general ed classrooms. So we use those in a similar fashion to determine um, the case load or class size for, for our special ed staff and, and our therapists that we employ. And we also look at uh, current and past trend data around placements and uh, referrals for special education and we, we know what our hit rate is about. Just by way of background we have a at any given point in time, anywhere from 700 to 750 students in the district who have been identified with a disability who receive special ed service. It's about 12% of our district population. So when we went through uh, trying to uh, identify spaces for the January meeting, uh, what I can share with you, uh, and this has been um, our pattern in the last couple of years in a couple of areas, but our, our programs with severe disabilities, so it would be students with severe cognitive disabilities or um, students with autism more on the severe end of the spectrum, we are at or above our guidelines, and we have been for a couple of years. Uh, we've made adjustments to, to, so we are very tightly staffed there. When we look at our programs that are for students with more mild to moderate disabilities, I can give you some examples here. Um, we have about 10 to 11 percent available capacity if you just looked at the students currently in the programs. But when you look at the number of students, and at the elementary level that equates to 22 spots. We've had 96 referrals so far this year and we average about 130 a year. So we have a long way to go in the school year and those numbers are much higher than 22 at the elementary level. And you can basically take about 70 percent of those numbers Bec uh, if you're thinking of the elementary. So uh, we are three times, we could pre accurately project about three times more than the spaces we have available at the elementary level. Um, another key piece for you to keep in mind is uh, kind of to dovetail with what Nancy reported, students with disabilities have a legal requirement to have access to the general ed curriculum. So if we don't have space in the general ed curriculum, then it's kind of a moot point for special ed because our special ed students generally are in the general ed program more than they are getting uh, special ed services. So they ha we, have to, we have to get past that first filter. Um, so when we think of the middle school and high school, um, if we don't have uh, general ed spaces, then we, we wouldn't be able to approve a special ed placement for if we didn't have general ed availability. Ho hopefully that makes sense. Um, even though we've had, we have trended uh, slightly down and we're doing a good job of that, we, we, uh, that's often offset by the number of move-in students we receive who, with students who move into our district on, on a uh, special ed education plan. So at this point, um, and I'm including early childhood in the mix too because we are seeing increasing numbers of um, referrals from the birth of three placements from the county. Um, our referral numbers, not only currently but historically, really indicate that we are gonna exceed our availability for space. So um, we, we virtually, uh, to be able to uh, anticipate that growth and the placement of our own students, um, I, would, I think you'll see that we really, in the end, do not have special education seats that available because we, we know we, we will fill those with our own students and probably exceed those spaces with our own students. So let's kind of leave it at that unless you have uh, questions. Um, I'll make uh, the, um, Corey and I would recommend a certain motion and then perhaps you could discuss and, and uh, consider what you'd like to do. Um, our recommended motion based on our evaluation of 
of uh, the requirements and uh, the data uh, is to approve 30 regular education seats for full-time open enrollment in grade three, 20 spaces in grade four, and 84 seats in grade five. Uh, no regular education seats are available in grades K, one, two, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, or 12. And no special education seats are available at any grade level, including early childhood. With this recommendation, we are taking the, um, the most um, aggressive projection of our growth versus a conservative. So questions? And Board member, questions whatever. or comments? Uh, comment. Mr. Bell. So if we allow open enrollment, can we um, put the, um, can I put the family kind of on notice that uh, we'll, we will ask for um, a resubmission upon you know, entering a new, uh, new school? Yes, the, the form letter that goes out through Mary's office um, <coughs> tells them that, that they must reapply by policy, by school district of Hudson policy, they have to reapply um, upon um, movement to the middle school. Um, we also um, started a few years ago strengthening the language in that form letter to make them perfectly aware that, that there is a likelihood that uh, seats or space would not be available at the secondary level. And, and so that it's at their, you know, they would know that ahead of time. And is there any precedence or anything that uh, you, you went back and uh, shared some kind of history on this? Is there any precedence uh, of issues where we've uh, allowed open enrollment in elementary school and haven't allowed in uh, the middle school or high school? Trying to think. That you know of? Yes, we did. Yes, we did at one time. I'm thinking. Yes, we did. So, do you see any mm -hmm. Do you see any legal challenges, or have you been advised that um, that uh, there could be the appeal of that decision, and mm -hmm. uh, that we would have? We to have. That? We've had. Um, we've had just a handful of appeals, and we have prevailed on several, and we've lost several. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other board member questions or comments? Madam Chairman. Sandy. Um, I am not an advocate of open enrollment. I haven't been since I've been on the board. I voted against it whenever it's come up. Um, I'm opposed to this also to uh, allocating these seats to open enrollment. Uh, though if I'm understanding correctly, we're required to, to do this now as of January 1st. We need to let the state know. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's our understanding. Okay, so that's what this is all about: is just letting the state know what we would project that we would have available. Um, uh, it isn't. It isn't uh, specifically forwarding to the state these number of seats. It's. It is. It is evidence, though, um, of compliance with the regulation. And if there were an appeal in May or 30 days thereafter, the decision of the board, then the DPI would go back to um, the record of this meeting. Oh, so this information is not sent to anyone. We just need to do this and then keep it in our records? That's, that's correct. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still against this. I, I think for us, with the crowding problems that we have in the secondary level, <coughs> for us to think about building additional space to enable to accommodate, to be able to accommodate open enroll students um, in addition to our own students, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I am against open enrollment and I will always vote against it. Thank you, Sandy. Any other board member questions or comments? I have a comment. Pat? Okay. This isn't a thing we can say yes or no to. This is where we have to say how many seats we have available because this is the law of the state. The state says that we have open enrollment. We cannot say here, well, we're not going to have any seats available in, in, in any of these classes because we aren't for building school for I don't know what. But anyway, what I want to go back and ask um, 
you were talking about um, Nancy, you were talking about a case that we had. Now, was this from last year that yes. somebody? Yes. And we had said we didn't want someone to go from Denied. fifth grade to sixth grade because, because there was no was room. Mm -hmm. But they had siblings? No. Or no siblings? No, they were not residents of the school. They were not even enrolled in this school. They had never even been enrolled? No. We, how did DPI allow, we, we had to allow them in our middle school? Yes, because despite the lack of space available, we did approve um, the um, enrollment of some open enrolled students from the elementary to the middle, and they viewed that as a violation of our policy. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Isn't, what, what didn't those people have siblings in? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. So uh, we need to change that? Well, Siblings well, policy, can't go on? The policy, which, which parallels the law, this district will give preference to non-resident students and to siblings of non-resident students who are already attending school in this district only. If space is available in the schools, programs, classes, and grades, no preference will be given if no space is available for open enrollment in the greater program. And DPI viewed the, uh, us as having no space and yet allowing um, the currently open enrolled uh, students uh, with siblings in. I don't understand. Really? I mean, mm -hmm. and this, per this person that came into the sixth grade wasn't even in first, second, third, fourth, fifth no. in our school district? No. He just came, they came in and asked for him to come in here at this point? Yeah. So do we have to shore that up somehow, not to have that happen again, or what? We just have to follow our policy. I don't understand. I thought mm -hmm. we were. We didn't follow our policy mm -hmm. last year? No. What did we do? There was no space available at the middle or the high school level, and we did allow um, students to enter. And because there was no I thought space. we had a policy that said we, that if we had siblings, no they preference could. can be given if space is available. Otherwise, you ca we cannot. So we. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we can. Okay, then we can't allow any more of these from fifth grade into the sixth grade then, anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it, it, it's, of course, you know, up, up to you. These are, these are calculations. This is data to base your decision on. If you see it a different way, if there's a different a calculation to determine a projection or whether space is available, um, it appears to us from the data, three different ways of looking at it, that there is not space at the middle or the high school level. And, and um, it, and again, going back to the policy, and, and there's some reference to the statute as well, we can consider instructional um, uh, programs. We've heard even at the high school that uh, some of our instructional programs are modified because of space concerns. Um, so there's multiple um, variables that one could apply to the middle school and the high school. But we can, can we, we can't keep them out of those, okay, you had third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. We can't keep them out of there for any reason, but we have to keep everybody else out of middle if, school. If space is available, we are required by law to um, admit open enrolled students with parameters of policy. And the parameters would be reapplication, you know, space available, and, um, but you have to base it on some data. It cannot be just, it cannot be arbitrary. They use the word arbitrary. Hmm. Maybe yeah. the and I can, I can understand, I was going to say in, uh, in reference to, to Sandy's thoughts, and I think Brian's too, um, the, the law isn't, it isn't really very friendly to us. There, many school districts in Wisconsin just love this, and they are out there marketing and trying to get students, desperately get them, and we are trying to stop our growth. This law isn't for us. And, and yet it applies to us. Madam Chairman? Mm -hmm. Sandy? Am I correct then from what you're saying that if we had 
last year we should have allowed no students, no open enroll students going into the sixth grade, even though they had been here, say one through five. That was DPI's determination. If we had said no to all of them, we would not have had an appeal on the one who was not currently in the district and wanted to come in. Am I correct? Well, at that level. Yes, that's but what I at, mean. But at the elementary level. I, I'm not talking about okay. elementary. I'm okay. talking about the one that was appealed. Yep. Okay. That's correct. So if we had said no to all of the ones that's coming from the elementary into the sixth grade that are already in the elementary, if we had said no to those students, then we would not have had an appeal on the one who wasn't currently in the district and wanted to come in. <coughs> well, we might have had an appeal, but even if we had an appeal, we would have prevailed. Uh, well, I thought you said we, they, we, we lost because we allowed fifth graders or other, yeah, fifth graders who were currently in the open enrollment program in our fifth grade. We allowed them into the sixth grade because they were currently in our fifth grade. And so the DPI uh, uh, ruled against us because we did that. That's right. Okay, so that is my point. Um, for us to, to take these students in in one through five, and then we're gonna have to throw everybody out in six because if we don't, we're gonna have to allow everybody at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade level and all the way up. And we don't have room in the uh, middle school or the high school to allow anybody in here who is not currently in living in this district. So that is exactly what I'm trying to make, make my point about. But they don't. If we allow them in at one through five, if we, we're gonna have to kick them all out when they get to sixth, and I mean all of them, and then they can appeal, but we should win those appeals if we, allow, if we don't allow any of them in. We should win the appeals. Um, that would be DPI's right. position. Um, Thank you, that's my point. I have a pet, another point. Last year, if we would have said no to anybody coming in to the sixth grade, um, we would have had been appealed by I'm not sure how many we let in, two or three. Um, we would have lost those appeals because we have a policy that says that siblings can come in. So we need to change our policy, don't we? No, we need, to, no, we need to follow our policy. The, the policy says that you'll, you'll allow for sibling preference only if space is available. Mm -hmm. And we allowed for sibling, sibling preference even though space wasn't available. Oh, so our policy is sound. It was um, allowing sibling preference outside of space okay. parameters. Okay, now we just have to follow. Good. Okay, I was, okay. Dan, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, this is, this whole thing is sort of troubling to me, um, mm -hmm. especially looking at our space situation at the middle school and high school. Um, I wasn't jotting down all of the, the numbers you were throwing out there, but were you um, proposing yeah, that in the middle school and the high school that there, that we would be able to allow? No, so, do you have no. this in front of you, this record here? Uh, Don't you have I, this? Oh, attached to the agenda, the numbers are okay. there. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, but I guess going back to Brian's point, you know, this, the policy is pretty open to interpretation because when you look at, um, you know, uh, based on optimum class size, student teacher ratios, instructional factors, building capacity, number of students attending district for tuition and enrollment projections, it seems like you could meet, you know, two or three of those as arguments uh, against it. But then, let's say in a given class, there is space available. So, what what carries the most weight when you're looking at these? When there's an appeal, and again, it um, when but there I mean, is when, an when we're making, we when, have to when you're we have to file a, a brief, and the brief would contain, they they would ask us for information about building capacity. We have to provide the class size guidelines. We have to provide a copy of the policy. We have to provide um, a, a a transcript of of the board meeting where action was taken. Um, so we have to provide evidence of all of that. Is and there then, a line of reasoning that you've mm -hmm. been able to glean from these these mm -hmm. rulings that you know would give us some pretty good insight in terms of what the line of reasoning seems to be very um, the law itself is a very parent friendly law, and so the leaning of it appears, and other districts would say this too. You know they they would look for reasons to 
um, uh, to for the appeal to prevail. So um, I don't know. I do remember um, uh, losing um, a. We denied an app, a couple of applications to Holton years ago, where the class sizes were low, but we had such. Um, uh, full classes in other parts of the district and we were starting to cap and bus kids to Holton and we wanted to preserve that space in order to do that and DPI said no we had space in those classes okay so mm -hmm. um, these 84 seats that you're recommending in grade 5 um, we would be potentially admitting those those students and then as we've discussed, that when they go up to the middle school, and they would be fully aware of that. Yes, okay. and, and we've we we've made that? them aware of that, mm -hmm. but um, I think they still are hopeful and expecting and pressuring and, you know, I, you can't blame them, you know. Mm -hmm. Mary. Madam Chair. Um, I know that board members know, but I just, I think this discussion is really an important one, but can be very confusing to mm -hmm. our community who's listening. And it can sound like we have many uh, open enrolled students within yeah. the district, yeah. and that's not the case. I can so tell you for this year, we have 31 students in 13 grades, kindergarten through 12th. Um, and w that are coming into the district, so 31 from outside the district coming into seats in our district, and we have 47 who are going out, who are Hudson School District resident students who could go to school here but are going out. So we have more going out than coming in, and I know we're talking about 84 and so forth, but um, really the number is, is mm -hmm. fairly small, still affects our space, so mm -hmm. still important. Mm -hmm. You've seen the uh, chart, I think, that Diane Radel put together that showed the history of the a approved applications and the numbers that actually do come. It's, it's a relatively small percentage uh, that, do, that do come. I, I can tell you, though, that the year after next, um, there are six <coughs> current fourth graders. I think I've got six. Uh, current fourth graders that are open enrolled now who will be going to six the year after next if, we allow them. if you allow them Nancy I have two questions for you first mm -hmm. um, what would happen if we didn't approve any regular education seats period well if someone appealed um, you know we would again my office and our attorney would do the best we could to defend the decision um, but we might lose Okay, and secondly, do these projections include looking at capping prairie? Uh, that's one of the factors that we would certainly introduce if, if we were to um, have an appeal. So these but you heard the report, and, it, and it, uh, right now um, it, it doesn't appear that this would happen next year in terms of the... Um, Oh, the capping going to well, other buildings. We're looking at total oh, yeah. grade capping doesn't yeah. matter. Um, those those uh, figures are are in here. And oh, the other thing that you should know, even though it's a district wide calculation, there are seats in third, fourth, and fifth. Um, but they we determine which school. And so we we adhere to our class size guidelines, and it's not necessarily the school that's requested by the parent. Often not. It's often Holton, although a lot of people, a lot of non-residents like Holton and like to go to Holton. Mm -hmm. okay, board members, any other questions or comments? Just, just one more question. Uh, do you know how many open enrolled students we have right now in the high school or middle school? Yep. We have, um, it, well, I, I projected it for next year, okay. Um, at the high school, there would be 11. Middle school and the middle school three. So, uh, I think one question um, that we have to think about as a board is, if we say that we have uh, space in elementary school by mm -hmm. this data, which is mm -hmm. it's hard to refute. We do have space in elementary schools, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
that what I'm hearing is in order for us to make sure that we protect our middle school and our high school, we have to prepare as the board to deny all open enrollment next year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should, uh, we should, you know, it may be something we put our, uh, our families on, you know, kind of let them know that we may get to a decision that we have to say no more open enrollment. Otherwise, it seems like this precedence that anyone who appeals from this elementary school mm -hmm. could get it, could uh, could get their um, appeal, uh, you know, um, approved. Just mm -hmm. you know, that's a uh, mm -hmm. that's a uh, that's a of serious concern for these parents, right? Yeah. So. Any other yeah. board member questions or comment? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So move. Pat, I think you're gonna, we're going to need some specifics on the okay. language. To approve 30 regular education seats for full-time open enrollment in grade 3, 20 seats in grade 4, and 84 seats in grade 5. No regular education seats are available in grade, do I read that? K yes, keep going. K1, 2, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and, or 12 and no special education seats are available at any grade level, including early childhood. Motion by Pat. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second by Brian. Roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, starting with Sandy, please. Is there any other discussion? I'm sorry. Any other further discussion? My only discussion is I'm proving this based off of uh, there is room in elementary school, but um, <coughs> that open enrollment in secondary or middle school I don't support at all. That's and right. I just want every family that's listening to understand that all open enrollment is you know is uh, of question in in our middle school and high school next year, even if you're currently open enrolled. It's gone. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, just want to go back and reinforce with Nancy. If this motion went down, so um, we uh, approve no space, no openings in elementary, can you talk about what we would expect on an appeal? Well, we'd have to, we'd have to provide the data that I talked about. We'd have to provide the capacities of our buildings, the enrollments, the projections, much of the data that I've just provided to you. Right, but what I'm saying is, what's the potential of that appeal being turned over? And I'm thinking back to the Holton case where you talked about um, we had openings and we said no, and then it was overruled. How much did we spend? Couldn't DPI determine we have space? And well, they'd use our own data. Yeah. And say we did. Yeah, they'd yeah. use our own data. So it's, it would yeah. put us at risk for more students coming yeah. in than we really so, yeah. intended. Yeah. Okay, and that's what I wanted yeah. to. And I also just want a clarification here, again, speaking to the parents out there, there are students open enrolled at the high school who, who reapplied, you know, at middle. They do not need to reapply again. They will finish and they will gradu graduate. Yeah. Um, so um, we, the policy and, and the law only gives the board authority to um, require reapplication once. Okay. 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 There's so on, those. on the new school. Yes, on the new level, yeah. going into if you're elementary, going into middle. If you entered at middle, going into high school. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So there's a motion by Pat, a second by Brian. We're going to do a roll call vote, starting with Board Member Gerke. Gerke, no. Bell, I. German, I. Robson, I. Motion carries. Okay, next item on the agenda is Corey with the St. Croix County Health and Human Services Clinic Site Memorandum of Understanding. Okay, thank you. This is the first of two items you'll see tonight, and this first one is, um, let me give you a little bit of background here. Wisconsin statute requires the Department of Health Services uh, in each county 
uh, the responsibility of prevention and control of, of communicable diseases, including acts of bioterrorism, and that's really what this is about in pre prevention or a response, I guess I should say, if, if there was a, that kind of bio or a public health emergency. So this first agreement is a reflection of the uh, proposed agreement between St. Croix County and the Hudson School District to allow the county to use our one of our facilities uh, for mass distribution of medication should we have something like a, a mass uh, bioterroristic attack such as uh, primarily their example would be anthrax or maybe smallpox, something to that degree. They have a need to distribute 85,000 doses of medication within 48 hours. So what the county needs is multiple sites to distribute that medication and they would like to use one of our facilities to assist in that. So this, this first agreement would just allow them to use our facility. They run the show. We are not, it would be a public uh, access type of situation and, and they would take over and you can see some of the details there. They would um, uh, need to be able to take over within 24 hours of, of an event like that and uh, use reasonable care of our facilities and replace any supplies they might need to use. They would, they're prepared to use their own supplies um, and that either party could terminate the agreement within 60 days. But we are recommending to the board that we agree to provide this to the county as a service should there be a, a, a large uh, public health emergency of that magnitude. Madam Chair, move to approve. There's a motion on the floor by Brian. <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Second by Sandy. Any further discussion? Dan? Question, Madam Chair. Um, in this agreement, does it talk about um, liability issues? Who's responsible for any type we, of a mis mishap or? The first one's just a memo of understanding for, okay. for a public use piece. Um, so all the liability would be incurred by the county because we're just basically saying you use our facility, but we are not, okay. we're not actually involving any of our staff in that. Okay. Does that, does that help? Any other questions or discussion? There's a motion by Brian, a second by Sandy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next on the agenda is the agreement between St. Croix County and the Hudson School District for use as a closed point of dispensing site. Corey, again. Yep, this is a little bit different. So this, if an event like this were to occur, um, we would identify another site in this agreement in the district where we would be able to provide the medication to our employees and their families who reside in, in our community. So we have a number of employees that don't reside in our community and they would need to access that medication wherever they reside. For example, we have a number of employees that live in Minnesota. So they would have to access that where their residence is. But this is for our staff and their families. There is a process in the, on the front end that identifies <coughs> our staff, who, the, who those staff are and their number of families and there's a a number of pre uh, activities that would help with the uh, point of dispensing. So this is called a closed point of dispensing, meaning we'd have another location where just our employees and their families could, could do, uh, ac have access to this. And the reason for it is, uh, for one, the size, uh, as an employer, we are the biggest employer in the county. And also uh, there's an effort to, from a service standpoint, public service standpoint, to get uh, services up and running as soon as possible. So this would assist us it would also relieve stress on the public access site in the district in the in the district so this is a positive thing for our employees and it would relieve any congestion partially relieve any congestion we might see in a mass you know, distribution of medication in an event like this so this is a fairly lengthy document this Dan to your comment earlier this does include the types of questions you have there because it does would involve some of our staff assisting in the dispensing of the medication it would involve our nurses and health staff more than likely and we will continue to have uh, follow-up meetings to to work out the process here to give you a little bit better idea the first document is uh, for public access is more for a drive-through scenario all the doses are prepackaged. this is oral medication it's delivered and it's taken somewhere else um, this uh, for our staff there would be a little bit more of an intensive process to get them through a building and not just a drive-through kind of scenario so this would be a service we could provide to our own employees. Let's hope we don't need either one of these. Um, but I think we, we, owe, we owe it to uh, the county to help assist with this. Madam Chair, move to approve. Motion by Brian. Second. Second by Sandy. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. 
Motion carries. Thank you. Next item is the revised communi um, community engagement plan. Um, I'm going to be reading a statement from um, President Holland as he is not here. Um, the statement says, after careful consideration and based upon the suggestions from the initial advisory committee leaders, we have decided not to move forward with the development of the community advisory committee. The principal point presented at our last initial organizing committee meeting and agreed upon by all committee members was that it was more advantageous and inclusive of the district to not develop a small group of advisors, rather to allow many voices the opportunity to provide feedback regarding the planning for decisions ahead for secondary space solutions. I'm grateful to the 25 applicants interested in serving on the community advisory committee and encourage them to become or continue their engagement through other avenues for participation provided by the district to the community as a whole. C committee members that were involved, do you want to, any board member comment? I would like to make a comment. I was involved in this committee. Um, I'm assuming since Mr. Holland was at the committee and was involved, <coughs> that these are his words, that he, he wrote this statement. Is that correct, Mary? Okay. Well, I'd like to make a clarification to his statement when he refers to all committee members agreeing to dissolve the Citizens Advisory Committee because it was more advantageous and inclusive to not develop a small group of advisors. I, I really want to make it clear why I agreed to abolish the Citizens Committee, and I did agree to abolish it, but not for the reasons stated. In way of explanation, um, so the public knows what's happened, the initial advisory committee was appointed to establish a format under which the Citizens Advisory Committee would operate. The members of the initial committee were Mr. Holland, Mr. Bell, Mr. Moen, Mr. Bourget, and myself. During the planning meeting, this group determined that 10 people from the public would be appointed to serve on the committee along with Mr. Moen and Mr. Bourget. The 10 citizen members are to be chosen to represent a cross-section of the community. The fact that 10 applicants would be chosen was well known to the public and the board. An application process was put in place and 25 citizens applied to be on the uh, CAC. At the last meeting of the five members of the initial committee, Mr. Moen suggested that because 25 applied and there were only 10 spots to be filled, that it might be wiser to disband the CAC and instead hold more public meetings in the same format as the World Cafe meetings that were held at Camp St. Croix. Uh, Mr. Moen stated that it would be difficult to tell 15 of the 25 applicants that they were not going to be on the CAC. The concern was, of course, disenfranchisement of the 15 who had applied but would not be placed on the committee, even though uh, the, the choice that we were going to, the fact that we were going to choose 10 was well known. But during this conversation, I had no objection to disbanding the CAC. But my reason for supporting this action was not as indicated in Mr. Holland's statement. At the meeting, I specifically said that I was in favor of dispensing with the CAC because I strongly believed that the CAC would serve no useful purpose since the board had already made the decision to consider only three options for a long-term space solution, and I thought the public would come to the same conclusion. I further stated that I was concerned about wasting the citizens' time attending numerous meetings January through March for no reason. That is why I agreed to disband the CAC, not because 15 applicants would be denied um, involvement or because I thought additional small group meetings would be helpful. Um, my expressed opinions were quite the opposite of that. Also, Mr. Bourget did not agree to disband the CAC in order to have more group meetings involving community members. Uh, in fact, when Mr. Moen suggested holding additional World Cafe type style group meetings, Mr. Bourget flatly stated he would not be involved because he had, had attended both of the preceding two meetings and he felt that they were not beneficial. So for Mr. Holland to suggest, which is what it sounds like in his statement, that all of the initial organizing members were in agreement uh, to disband the CAC because it would be better to include many voices, uh, Mr. Holland's statement is misleading. That is not what happened. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Any other board member questions or comments? Mr. Uh, just one comment. I was uh, a member of the uh, steering committee for this, and uh, I, I share the same. I respect Sandy's opinion for why she chose not uh, her her statement. So, uh, but for myself, um, I'm in like, uh, more in alignment with Tom in terms of I want to make sure that everyone had a voice, and 
make sure that um, um, I didn't want to have a group of 10 when there seems like there was 25 very um, deserving applicants, and I want to make sure they all had a voice and uh, could share in the process. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other board member questions or comments? No? no. Madam Chair, we will need a, a motion then to eliminate the community advisory committee from the engagement process since there it was approval of the board to include it. Okay, board members, I'll entertain a motion to that effect. Um, move to approve the disbanding of the CAC. Motion by Brian. Second by Dan. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent item. So if one of my fellow board members could please read the language surrounding expenditures and to move the consent items forward. Mr. Bell. Move to approve the consent items, including that the Director of Financial Services be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $742,330.51. Motion by Brian. Second. Second by Dan. All those in, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Uh, Madam Chair. There were four retirees in that list. <coughs> Can I comment on that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, Judy Nelson, a teacher at the middle school, special educator uh, for 16 years. Uh, she wrote a letter to the board and to um, superintendent. Uh, and she said, my years spent as the cognitive disability severe teacher at the Hudson Middle School have been truly unforgettable. I am blessed to have had the privilege to work with wonderful professionals and amazing children. I sincerely thank you for this opportunity. Neil Paulson uh, has been the IT network administrator in the district for 18 years and he has, um, I think, touched every one of us and every one of our offices. He writes, do I have to meet with you to get things started? <laughs> and I said, you don't have to, but please. <laughs> okay. So then uh, Barb Bainline, Barb Bainline, 21 years um, as a special education assistant in our ABLE program at the high school. Um, and Barb writes, um, this will be a bittersweet event in my life. I have enjoyed my years of service to the Hudson School District and my commitment to the ABLE program. The students in the ABLE program have been special to me. Matching their needs with my particular talents has been fulfilling and at times challenging. Working with the talented and dedicated staff over the past 21 years has offered me many opportunities for growth and enrichment. And Bobby Sinnott, Roberta Bobby Sinnott, um, 38 years wow. teacher at the uh, middle school. And uh, she writes, uh, it's been my pleasure to teach sixth grade in the Hudson School District for the past, she says, 39 years. Uh, thank you for granting me the opportunity to create a lifetime of wonderful memories at Hudson Middle School. My students have always been my inspiration. My passion, dedication, enthusiasm have remained strong over the years. This is a bittersweet, is the, is the terminology again. Bittersweet moment for me, and I will miss the joys of teaching. I started teaching when the Hudson Middle School began. I leave knowing this school is one of excellence. I am proud to have been part of this great school and district. Thank you, Nancy. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing those stories, yep. and thank you to those employees for their service to the district. Yeah. We appreciate their efforts. Okay, moving on. We're on to committee reports. Um, first is Mr. Chernoway with Finance Committee. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just quickly, we've covered uh, the items in, our, in the board agenda this evening that came before the Finance Committee, including the short-term space for learning recommendation for high school, middle school, employee compensation and the administrator compensation. So I think we've pretty well covered those. I'll Any questions for Dan? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on. I am going to be Mr. Holland, 
for the Facilities and Grounds Committee meeting. Um, facilities and Grounds Committee meeting, uh, excuse me, met last evening with Brian Bell attending on behalf of Mr. Holland. All of the items on our agenda were reviewed in the previous sections of the board meeting with the exception of the last item, which is architect interviews and selection for pre-referendum support. Um, the interview team consisted of um, Superintendent Bo Negerbrotten, Tim Erickson, Jim Stasekel, Tom Holland, and me. Um, interviews were held last Friday afternoon, and we interviewed four firms. DLR Group out of Minneapolis, um, ATSNR out of Minneapolis, Bray Architects out of Milwaukee, and, Hop and Hoffman out of Appleton. The format for the interview was a 20 to 25 minute presentation and a 20 to, twi 20 to 25 minute um, Q&A session session and we are in the process of requesting financial proposals based on a more refined scope of work and checking on um, references and we'll have a final recommendation to the board in February any questions for me okay moving on to personnel and Pat you're going to cover for mr. Kaiser shot okay personnel committee met last night and we talked about most everything we talked about tonight with Nancy, the wage and salary market adjustments, um, the administrative compensation recommendations, and we also talked about the school calendars for the next three years, and this will come to the board for approval in February, mm -hmm. and um, the human resource director selection process, the timeline, as Mary shared tonight, and then we went to closed session to consider employment, promotion, and compensation of public employees. Okay, thank you, Pat. Last item on our agenda, would one of my board fellow board members please read the language to adjourn to closed session? Dan? <laughs> Here we go. Hang on. Madam yeah. Chair, Here. Here, I move, to I a, move to adjourn no, no, to closed I session. It. I had it. Uh, like Dan has the floor. Yeah, out of order. <laughs> Adjourn to closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851C to consider employment, promotion, and compensation of public employees. Motion by Dan. Second. Second by Brian. Do you need a roll call, Mary, or not? Yes, yeah, roll call. Roll call vote. We'll start with Bell Mr. Bell. Gerke, aye. Robson, aye. Chernow, aye. German, aye. We will not be returning, correct? Right. We will not be returning. That's correct. <laughs>